Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about government and public affairs in Kansas and Wichita. Broadcast on Great Plains Television, Channel 26.1, various times both Saturdays and Sundays. Sunday at 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. are the regular times, but others as well. And also at my site, The Voice for Liberty, that's on the internet at wichitaliberty.org. You'll find all the old episodes of Wichita Liberty TV, show notes for things we talk about in each episode, and all the other material that I and others create on almost a daily uh, basis. Our guest today is Dr. Edward Stringham. He's the Davis Professor of Economic Organizations and Innovation at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. He's the editor of the Journal of Private Enterprise, president of the American Institute for Economic Research, past president of the Society for Development of Austrian Economics, and also the Association of Private Enterprise Education. He is a prolific author, and his book is Private Governance, Creating Order in Economic and Social Life, published by Oxford University Press. I think that's one thing we'll talk about pretty soon. Also, we have co-host Carl Peter John. And Carl, thanks for taking over for me the last month or so while I've been dealing with some, uh, some family issues and so forth, so I appreciate that. And uh, Ed Stringham, welcome to Wichita Liberty right. TV. Thanks. So I think that you are an expert in Bitcoin and blockchain technologies. And Bitcoin is the virtual cryptocurrency, however, however you might want to describe it. Been in the news quite a bit the couple months because of some amazing runs in its price. So what's happened with Bitcoin lately? So it's gone from this very obscure thing that only a bunch of... Uh, Nerds. Nerds talk about it to uh, something that every single person I run into is talking about it, uh, in large part because of these huge price increases. So mm -hmm. going uh, up to $20,000, uh, then down, it's very, very volatile. Yeah. So the uh, currency itself, I have to say, I was very skeptical of people creating this private currency that is uh, basically a ledger of mm -hmm. 21 million coins. And I thought, oh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Jeffrey Tucker, who mm -hmm. works uh, also at the uh, American Institute for Economic Research, he said, ah, oh, here, I'll give you some Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And I said, ah, no, I don't, need, I don't need that. Who wants that stuff anyway? Um, but you know, I think he used some to buy, or to, he sold one of his bow ties to somebody for several bitcoin. Yeah, so uh, you know, this is th th tens of thousands of dollars uh, that I turned down. He might have given me m much more. Uh, for all I know, it was fifteen dollars, mm -hmm. and then <coughs> now it's way, way higher than that. So it does get a lot of attention. I ran into some couple of my students in. Uh, uh, who had graduated, they said, we were just talking about you yesterday. I said, are you serious? I said, yeah, yeah, we, we, were, we were buying Bitcoin, so we were talking about you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then I was in, I was in a, a random working class bar in Poughkeepsie, and the people at the bar were talking about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just really uh, quite something. And I think a lot of it is showing proof of concept and showing that, uh, uh, you know, this thing is not dependent on government. It is a private currency. That's right. And it allows people to put their money in a, um, I don't want to call it an asset, but a token, a coin, mm -hmm. that uh, is not under the control of government in any way. But, but some would say it's really not a currency, it's a commodity. How would you respond to those folks? So, because that's how it's, I think the government's trying to regulate it that yeah, way. Yeah, so, you know, it is, it is unclear how we would consider it at this point. It, it's not a widely accepted medium of exchange, mm -hmm. and that's one definition of money, one of the characteristics of money. So you can use it with some people, with certain restaurants, we'll, we'll accept it. But that's probably been the biggest, I would say, um, disappointment <coughs> at Bitcoin is that it really hasn't blossomed into a medium to transact your daily business at the grocery store and wherever else you go. Well, sure, but uh, I don't think that uh, where it's gone has been unsuccessful. I think it ha has been much more successful 
than I would have predicted. Mm -hmm. So uh, these things can take time. So there's in economics what are called network effects. If you are the only person in the world with a telephone, it's not going to be worth much. Right. If you're the only person with a credit card or credit ma card machine, it's not going to be worth much. And so Bitcoin, I think, is quite impressive. The fact that it's getting more and more users, more and people, more people involved with it. As we start going in that direction, then you might st see more stores actually accepting it. And Bitcoin has uh, has spawned competitors. There are maybe a dozen or more of these cryptocurrencies that operate in a similar fashion, which leads to can there be competition in the creation of money? So that sounds like a strange thing, but I think uh, you might have some thoughts about that, and we'll talk about that when we get back from our commercial break. So we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks, Carl Peter John co-host, and Professor Edward Stringen is our guest today. So talking about Bitcoin in the first thing, being a, a currency that's created outside of government, can't really be controlled by government, that seems foreign to many people. And I know that at your institution, American Institute for Economic Research, you have a sound money project. And a lot of people would say, okay, here's this $20 bill. What could be more sound than that? I've got my deposits in my checking account. What could be more sound? What's wrong with our money that we have? And can money be created outside of government? Oh, certainly yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> so um, the American Institute for Economic Research was founded in 1933, oh. right around... Uh, uh, the time where government was getting more and more involved with the money supply. Mm -hmm. uh, the founder was named E.C. Harwood, and he uh, was critical of government monetary policy in the 1920s, saying it was going to lead to a credit-induced boom and to economic fluctuations, which it did. Mm -hmm. And in 19, uh, early 1930s, 1933, uh, FDR basically told people, uh, you've got to turn in your money and you can't own gold anymore. And then he said, oh, by the way, for each of these um, dollars that you deposited, which, by the way, used to be defined as one twentieth of an ounce of gold, overnight, now it's one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold. And eventually, it just went more and more away from its original mm -hmm. value. So yes, you can have a $20 bill and it is going to be safe in your bank, but the value of that $20 bill can vary greatly over time as mm -hmm. it's eaten away by inflation, especially if you keep it in an account which is earning uh, zero interest or close to zero interest and the inflation rate is higher then the interest rate you're going to be getting on it, the more assets that you have tied up in dollar bills, the more that you're going to have your wealth eaten away. And I think a lot of young people that may not be as been around long as Carl and I, we don't remember under Richard Nixon, uh, Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford, that inflation was what, 10, 12% some years? In the 1970s, yes. Right. And, and right after World War II, there was a big, mm -hmm. uh, but we argued that there was a lot of repressed inflation from the, war, the price controls during the war. Mm -hmm. So what made that inflation happen? Well, the main thing is when government turns on the printing press in uh, general, if they double the amount of money in the economy, prices are going to double. The amount of real goods is not going to double, so the price of all goods is going to double. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in varying degrees in all different countries. And right now that's happening like crazy in places like Venezuela. Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Zimbabwe did it so much that they actually just had to stop issuing currency because mm -hmm. people just couldn't trust it. Right. But Argen all. Argentina's done this a number of times since in the, during the 20th century. The question I'd have for you, though, is the arguments made, we have little or no inflation. The Fed's been trying to actually push prices up to what they call the 2% limit. But the Fed's balance sheet's grown, and 
we see a lot of prices going up. For instance, Bitcoin, as dollar terms, has gone way up. But, um, you know, have we had repressed inflation during the last few it's, years? It's highly likely that the official statistics of inflation are not capturing all inflation. It may or may not be the case, I don't know. But the problem with government intervention and creation of more money is it doesn't show up at all times equally. And so it might show up more into one class of goods, such as the dot-com bubble, or maybe the um, uh, housing price increase from a few years ago. So we really have to be guessing at all times. A private currency like Bitcoin or any of these other ones, like Ether, Ethereum, we can, we can know, okay, there's 21 million of these units out there, and based on the way it's programmed, this is not going to change. So that does uh, provide an attractive alternative to maybe somebody who's living in Zimbabwe from 10 years ago or, or in Venezuela today. Well, Please. Professor Harwood would make the argument that currency, one of the key attributes is being able to be a store of value, and whether you have it as gold, silver, or some other, well, even copper, um, you have a store of value. But what is inherent in a Bitcoin, an Ethereum, or any of the digital currencies? Yeah, so one of the issues right now, and this is just not good or bad, but maybe bad, is there's huge amount of volatility. So if you're you know, saving to buy a car and it's in this uh, uh, currency, well, you might be able to end up with 10 of those cars overnight or, or maybe <laughs> one tenth of a car overnight. Yeah. And that's really something that uh, a lot of people might not have uh, predicted the huge amount of volatility that we see in this market. Yeah. And the inflations, uh, it seems like an obscure topic, but very destabilizing. I mean, one of the factors I think that led to the rise of Adolf Hitler to power was that Germany had the tremendous hyperinflation uh, in the years when he was starting to come about. So it does open the door for people to come in and say, I can fix this and uh, create all sorts of mischief after that. When we come back from our break, we haven't talked about gold yet, but is gold kind of like Bitcoin? Is gold a way that we could return back to sound money? So let's talk about that in just a moment. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. Bob Weeks here with co-host Carl Peter John, our special guest, Professor Edward Stringham of Trinity College. So we were talking about the importance of sound money, how the money that our government creates is not, doesn't really qualify as that. Bitcoin might be, but, but for centuries, maybe even longer, gold has been used as money, and it was money in America for some time. Can we go back to that, or what's good about gold as compared to just the Federal Reserve notes we have? Well, the great thing about a hard money like gold, and you don't need to carry it around with you. You can carry around a certificate that says you own this. But at the end of the day, the great thing about something like gold is you know it has alternative uses for things like jewelry or industrial Industry. uses. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to cash out, you could keep your money in the bank for your whole life, but at one time, if you want to cash out and say, I'd like to actually withdraw this physical metal or a certificate for that and then turn it into something else, you know what that is. You know that this is the equivalent of a ring or the equivalent of whatever amount that's going to go into some industrial use. Mm -hmm. And so there's no mystery about the value. Once the dollar became unhinged from, uh, from gold specifically, mm -hmm. there was no constraints on government just pressing print, 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 more on the printing press. Mm -hmm. And we saw that time and time again, just the price of it, uh, sorry, um, inflation going way up, the value of the dollar to other goods going way down. So the government has a very bad track record of actually sticking with sound money, whereas gold is gold is gold. There's nothing and else you about can't it. Automate. I mean, the supply of gold is not fixed, but it grows at a 
fairly predictable rate, and it takes yeah. a lot. If you watch like Gold Rush on TV, you know, it takes a lot of effort to get gold out of the ground to create the money we have either by printing or most of it's really by electronic ledger means. But who does creating that money benefit most? Well, someone spends it first. Yeah, don't I they? mean, part of the issue is the government is in debt, and so if they can monetize the debt, they can actually pay people ba back less than what originally they had proposed. Mm -hmm. So this we see this uh, with interwar Germany. They were required to re uh, pay back the debt in a fixed amount of marks, and they said, "Okay, great." <laughs> Print, 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 and the result is this huge hyperinflation. We all see the pictures of them having to the wheelbarrow take the wheelbarrow just to buy a uh, money, just to buy a loaf of bread. So government always has an incentive to uh, weaken the value of the money, mm -hmm. especially because they're the ones who actually are in debt so much. Mm -hmm. our, our mainstream liberal press. I saw some folks talking about the federal tax cut that was recently enacted, and they're saying. You're giving more people to money, they're going to spend it, it's going to be inflationary. How would you respond to that? I think it's, uh, well, I'll let you respond. Yeah, so I would say the main determinant of inflation, this is not unique to me, Milton Friedman, many other people have argued this for a long, long time, is the main determinant of inflation is government changes in the money, money supply. supply. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it is true that various factors can change prices a little bit, but when we're talking about huge sustained price increases, it's government monetary increases in the money supply. But the Federal Reserve increased their balance sheet by f roughly four times from, four to five times from 800 billion in 2008 up to right now somewhere between four and five trillion. That sh shouldn't that have been highly inflationary and, and why wasn't it? Well, I think it pushes that in, uh, in the inflationary direction, but at, at the same time, there was countervailing policies such as paying banks, basically paying banks not to lend out money, specifically through paying interest on reserves. So right now, a bank could lend money to private people, or they can deposit it with the Federal Reserve, and then they get paid the same thing. And so banks say, well, well why, why do I want to lend private people money when assume risk. I'm going to assume risk and get a very small interest rate in return. And so that was a very countervailing force. So you've got one policy that could push prices up, another could push prices down. But you recapitalized the banks in the process too, and many of them were rather shaky in 2008. That's true, but at the same time, you're paying banks to not be banks. You're taking out of the economy huge amount of uh, capital that could have been lent to people. It's very difficult, especially a few years ago, uh, I, uh, to get a loan. I, I got a, a loan in 2011, and it was basically impossible, like winning the, <laughs> a marathon, but I ended up getting it. But uh, Ben Bernanke, for example, could not refinance his home and could not get a mortgage. It's, that's what these policies are doing. They're starving the economy of financial services. And that was quite a turnaround from uh, a decade ago when uh, you know banks were giving mortgages to pretty much anybody who could breathe. So <laughs> we need to take our last break here. And when we come back, I want to ask Professor Stringham about Private Governance, the book that he wrote, and how is that different from government governance, and is it a good or bad thing? We'll be back in just a moment. Well, welcome back to this last uh, uh, segment of Wichita Liberty TV. Bob Weeks here with Carl Peter, John, and Professor Edward Stringham, our, our guest today. So in your book about private governance, I don't know if this was your quote or a quote of a reviewer, but it says, one of the most important things we can do is really explain and understand how markets and not government intervention are our best hope for an orderly and prosperous society. Now, people tell me all the time that markets are a dog-eat-dog -dog world where people are ripping each other off, and we've got to have government intervening in there to make things fair 
fair for people. So what's wrong with that line of thinking, if there is? I'm yeah, sorry. I would say the complete opposite. Markets enable people who otherwise might not care about each other to figure out how to cooperate for mutual benefit. And this is done not just for simple product markets like selling um, you know, a simple item or a meal at a restaurant, but it's also done in very complex markets to enable people to assure each other that they are going to deliver on their pro promises. Mm -hmm. And private governance, my book published with Oxford University Press, documents some of these examples. So for example, the New York Stock Exchange provides assurances to investors that this company is going to be relatively reliable. Now, not all of them are guaranteed success, but they have to go through listing requirements. They have to tell the investor, look, we are not a fly-by-night operation, and this basically puts a good house camping, housekeeping stamp of approval on any firm listed on the New York mm -hmm. Stock Exchange. And the origin of that was actually a tavern. It was called Tontine Tavern and Coffee House. People would show up to this tavern on Wall Street, and the tavern had rules and regulations about people who would conduct business there. So you knew the people there would be reliable. New York Stock Exchange, same thing. They had more formal rules and basically providing assurances that people are going to get what they are owed. And these are private institutions at this time, is that right? Exactly. And this continues on throughout history. All of the world's first stock markets were privately governed, privately regulated, making sure that people get what they owed, uh, rather than the government saying, we are going to force you to pay this, that, that. And we could see the same exact thing today with markets like eBay, with the rating systems, or with Yelp, with the rating systems, or with Airbnb, with Uber, you have a rating of the customer, you have a rating of the driver. And these services work behind the scenes to make sure that the market is working well. So I think you're saying that reputation. Now back in the old days, like the trading house at Lloyd's of London or something, you know, not much communication going on in those days, but those traders all knew each other. Today, we kind of have ways for distributed trust, like eBay, the rating system, Uber, and so forth like that. Is that making a big difference? Oh, it's huge. Lloyd's of London also started out as a coffee house mm -hmm. where people would show up to make these insurance-style contracts. Now what we have is this done on a massive scale using technology. So your credit card, PayPal, these things work behind the scenes to minimize the risk of fraud. You can give your credit card to any person, any merchant around the world, and they're going to get paid, mm -hmm. and you have this assurance. And people are now starting to borrow technology from uh, Bitcoin, blockchain technology. There's this thing called smart contract technology, where people are figuring out new technological ways to make sure people deliver what they promise and people get what they're owed. Mm -hmm. Well, as the rule of law is often cited, but is it really, how important is it in the commercial world for creating that type of confidence? Because the argument has been made that the government has to pr protect the public from uh, fraud. And uh, we, we, the, SEC, the SEC was put in place in the 1930s to, sub to correct the problems of Wall Street for the, during the Great Depression. And we've had uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission and other entities come in for other brokers. And frankly, internationally, there are a number of other institutions like that. Are they really necessary? Yeah, so I would argue that the assurances that we get that really matter are private. There was a guy named Harry Macropolis who uh, reported to the SEC that the Madoff Madoff. fraud was a fraud, and they're like, ah, we're, we're not really sure. And so it turned out to you know, not go well. Uh, but, but most other hedge funds actually use what are called third-party custodians, 
third-party accounting. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of hedge funds um, provide these assurances to people to make sure there's no Madoff style situation. Madoff, they can guarantee the success of your investments, but they they guarantee, kind of like FDIC almost, that your money's not going to be stolen from you by who you're transacting with. Exactly. So Madoff didn't provide those services. In most cases, the hedge fund doesn't even have, the hedge fund operator, the manager, doesn't even have the ability to withdraw funds from the accounts because it might be held by this large uh, company like Deutsche Bank or, or whoever it is, Bank of New York Mellon. And so we can't uh, uh, promise the value, but we can promise that there's m what you put in the account integrity. is there. So the SEC really failed with the Bernie Madoff thing. And uh, was anybody fired? Who was held accountable? I mean, I just think it's unrealistic to assume that government can actually provide those types of insurances. The uh, founder of American Institute for Economic Research, E.C. Harwood, said that one of the greatest scams in history was the creation of the Securities and Exchange Commission, where it's basically providing these fake assurances to people, uh, whereas we already do have plenty of private ones that work quite well and much better. You know, once in a while we have the restaurant inspections uh, printed in the newspaper or online and you read some of the horror stories there. But I'm wondering, who does the corner restaurant fear the most, the government inspector or public opinion of what happens if they serve food that makes a lot of people sick? Exactly. That's accountability <laughs> there. Exactly. So I never look at the you know, inspectors rating, but I do look at Yelp.com right. and if there's a thousand good reviews, I will be pretty sure that I'm going to get a good meal. Yeah. If there's a thousand negative reviews, well, I don't think that restaurant's going to be in business yeah. much longer. So it's private mechanisms that create order and cooperation, not the government. Well, very good. So we are out of time and over time today. So thank you very much, Professor Stringham, for stopping by today. Thank you, Carl. And uh, we'll be back with another episode next week. Thanks for watching.